Hello, it's uh, Bookish Talk. Uh, today our guest uh, comes from Scotland. It's uh, Tom McEwen, uh, a bookbinder. Hello, Tom. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, fine, how are you? Uh, not too bad, not too bad at all, thanks. Perfect. Uh, my co-host, uh, uh, Pavel, joins us from Moscow as usual. Hi, Pavel. Hi. <laughs> And uh, I'm Stepan. I'm currently in Versailles. Uh, and uh, well, let's let's dive in. Uh, uh, so we wanted to discuss a possible future appearance, uh, 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 your future ap- appearance on our podcast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'd, more we'd happy to. Definitely have uh, more more t- topics to cover with you. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I don't I don't know if you if you know, but I, I used to. I'm not. I haven't had a full career as a bookbinder. I had a a, pre- a previous career in the uh, industry and I uh, oh, spent 25 years making blocking dies, hand engraving blocking dies for bookbinders and uh, finishing tools. Mm-hmm. And I still do some of that work. Mm-hmm. Um, so that might be, an, you know, that might be something that you might find interesting to... Definitely. You know, I, I, have a, have a some point. I didn't know that. Uh, so sorry about that. I... I... I, I saw so many of your bindings, but uh, I, I didn't know about this previous part of your career. And that's definitely interesting to talk about. Another thing we really wanted to talk about at some point is uh, bookbinding in Scotland. Because All right. we, 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 we haven't talked, to, uh, I don't think, to any bookbinders from Scotland yet. So, so it would be interesting to, uh, to hear how it's organized, about exhibitions, uh, meetings, guilds. Any, um, anything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are the uh, the most interesting uh, uh, masters uh, uh, in your opinion, etc. Things like that. It's it's a kind of a mixed mixed bag at the moment. Um, in terms of design bookbinders, you know, there's there, there are very few. In fact, mm-hmm. and I think at the moment I'll be the only Scottish fellow of designer bookbinders. Okay. Uh, although the, you know there are. Uh, there are other design bookbinders who, who work in Scotland, but it's not many. You know, you're talking about a handful at most. Three or four possibly come to mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, has it always been like that? Has it always been mostly an English affair or has it some, somehow degraded over time? Well, sadly, we lost two Sco- well, there were Scottish bookbinders, but, you know, Faith Shannon... I don't know if you've heard of Faith Shannon. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I, I, I saw. Scotland. Yeah, I mean, she wasn't Scottish, but she, 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 she stayed in Scotland and worked for for a long time in mm-hmm. Scotland, and she was probably the, this, uh, you know, she was probably the most. She would have been the most important design bookbinder we had here, but but she died just a few years ago, mm-hmm. and more recently we had um, uh, Derek Hood. Mm-hmm. Who also died uh, rather sadly. Just just recently, yeah. Um, and he 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 was from St Andrews in Scotland, although he lived in England. Mm-hmm. And uh, we also have um, we have, you know we have uh, a fairly a thriving community who gather under the Society of Bookbinders. Mm-hmm. So we have. We, well, up until coronavirus uh, arrived, we, we met quite regularly, you know, at least, you know, well, maybe six, seven times a year we'd have a, a full meeting, but we always sort of kept in touch with each other, even out with those those periods. Um, but that's been kind of difficult over the last couple of years, as it, as it is for everyone, I suppose, suppose, you know. So th- there is actually a Scottish region in the Society of Bookbinders. Mm-hmm. And I think we have, I think maybe about 40 members, maybe a bit more, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. We, get, we get together and have, you know, we, we invite uh, tutors to give us a demonstration or a workshop, uh, or we organise visits to libraries or collections or, you know, the usual kind of stuff. We have one licentiate. Uh, of design and book binds in Scotland now. That's Gillian Stewart, and she works in Glasgow. And in fact, I had spent quite a bit of time training her here um, through a scholarship that she uh, was awarded. 
And I've got another uh, another uh, Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust Award winner mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with me at the moment. So there's, you know, the, the, she, and she's she's shown quite a bit of progress. So, so there is, you know, there is there is certainly a community. And what about the National Library of Sco- uh, Scotland competition? Something like Elizabeth Souter's? Yes, Souter. Yeah. Yeah, that that's quite a, that's quite a useful thing we have actually you know having ha- ha- having that local as it were so that happens I think now I think it's every two years now I can but it might be every year but um it, it's it's uh, that, that's quite good and it's reasonably well supported from uh, bookbinders throughout Europe so you know although it's uh, it's based in, in Scotland and you know there's certainly quite a number of UK entrants to it every year Uh, there's uh, very often that someone from Europe who is the winner in that competition, and there is a an exhibition uh, which uh, is put on as part of that uh, competition. And that that all happens in the National Library of Scotland in Edinburgh. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm trying to think if, if there's anything over and above that that might be sort of shine a, shine more light on this. But I do know that Edinburgh and Glasgow art schools have. Bookbinding elements in some of the courses, which is a good thing. Uh, I think that you know that's kind of keeps 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 the the, the craft alive. Um, and in fact, designer bookbinders have been going into some of the art schools in the UK to to give a taste of courses to, to the design students, and that's been happening in Scotland as well. Yeah. I, I guess I guess that's something that uh, we discussed uh, with the other uh, bookbinders uh, from uh, from the United Kingdom uh, with Kate Holland quite a lot. That uh, there are some programs or some elements of bookbinding in different programs in in different schools in in, uh, in mm-hmm. the United Kingdom, but there there is no single program dedicated to bookbinding and only bookbinding. No, and uh, that's that's quite upsetting. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I mean, I, I, at the moment, I'm. I think I'm the only place in Scotland where people can come to for certificated mm-hmm. courses, and you know, I have a steady flow of students coming through here now. I mean, it's it's almost uh, half my week is now spent teaching. Mm-hmm. So there is the, it's you know, it's it's. Um, It's it's quite strong. The bookbinding community is quite strong in Scotland. There's a book arts group as well. Um, was quite a widely um, distributed group of people. So you know, we, we, I suppose we all work very much in isolation, just on our own. But but we do get together from time to time, and we all know about each other, and you know, we, we kind of help each other out at times as well. When it comes to you know getting materials or using pieces of equipment things like that mm-hmm. and how how was it how was it uh, during this uh, past year especially with teaching i understand that in, in scotland uh, regulations were a bit stricter than in england uh, uh, or or how how was it yeah the, the way, i think they're a wee bit stricter but not hugely i don't think the difference is massive mm-hmm. for instance i know that we we've always had mask wearing this Part of our life over the last eighteen months, whereas for a long period in England that was that was uh, done away with. So th- there are certainly differences. It's not just Scotland and England. I think you know, but, but uh, there are different uh, regulations when it comes to coronavirus in Northern Ireland and in Wales because the health issues are, are devolved to those individual parliaments. Now, it, when coronavirus hit here, I, I mean, I didn't do. It. Any work for about four or five months, teaching or bookbinding. Well, I wasn't even allowed to come into the studio. <laughs> we we're just okay, told okay. you've got to go. You've got to go home, <laughs> and that was it. Uh, it's but obviously things are a bit, you know, have become a bit more relaxed. As the you know, as the months have gone past, and I, I, I started teaching regularly again back in the early summer this this year. Which month? Uh, I started back teaching in April, I think. Oh, April, okay. April. Mm-hmm. Certainly by early summer, you know, the students were all back in touch and we were, and, you know, I had quite a full calendar of uh, 
teaching commitments from then on. I have to say it's tapering off a wee bit now because of this new variant that has yeah, yeah. arrived. Uh, so I, I don't know what the next month or two is going to hold. But no one does. No, no. Yeah. No, the only predictable thing about all this is its unpredictability. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting yeah. getting used to unpredictability. <laughs> What was the old say, saying? If you want to humor God, tell him about your plans. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> And what about teaching not uh, at your place, but uh, in some institutions? I know places like Glasgow School of Art have a long-standing uh, bookbinding tradition, but they seem to have moved towards the craft and away from design, which is especially strange for the place like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I went to Glasgow School of Art because uh, I, I went through the sculpture department in the late 1970s. And when I started there, the bookbinding department had just closed a year or two before. So I've, I've never actually known there to be a bookbinding department in the, in the art school in Glasgow, but it was there just before I, I was a student because I used to hear some of this, this, the tutors talking about it. Uh, interestingly, some of the equipment is still there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's stored away in a cupboard and you know they've, they've got a letterpress case room in the art school. So there is some bookbinding activity that uh, takes place in there. And I've been up there a few times. And this is really strange because Glasgow did produce some of the most interesting uh, uh, bindings of the uh, early 20th century. Yes, yes, that's true. And um, because of, uh, you, you know, that Art Nouveau period and the, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s, there were, there were quite a number of, uh, I suppose they would be called design binding certainly by today's standards because they'd be sort of unique designs in that respect, but they all had that kind of art nouveau quality. Uh, and even, even in, uh, industrially, uh, book production in Glasgow, there was quite a, an influence in, from that art nouveau period. So there was, a, I don't know if you've heard of Blackie's, the, the publisher, but they had a, an art director called Tolan Morris, who produced some fantastic book designs. I mean, beautiful things, but it was done industrially. Um, you know, it wasn't done on a craft basis. It was it was more more commercial, but beautiful work that was produced. So well, it's well worth looking him up as a designer. Uh, and he had links to the art school. He he knew uh, Charles Rennie Macintosh and that that group of artists at that time. That's that's also interesting interesting thing. Uh, I think we discussed uh, that already with with some of our guests. When when design design bindings appeared, or when which were the first design binding in the in the middle of, of the 20th century, earlier, a bit later. Uh, how, how does it work? Uh, because well, definitely unique bindings existed even before that. But uh, yeah. uh, the the attitude towards them was was different, and the attitude to to toward uh, the modern design bindings is different uh, than to well anything else in the history, I guess. Yes, yes. It, it, so you know, I, I, I never, I always seem to think that the term design bookbinding is. <sighs> I'm not quite sure how, how, how you can define it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, they, are, they are certainly, you know, unique one-off books, I would say, you know, that, that's, that's a kind of good starting point. But beyond that, I'm not, I'm not really sure because, I mean, if it's just a one-off design binding, then some bindings that were produced in the 18th and 19th centuries could be could come under that definition. It'd be one-off, uh, you know, highly decorated with gold tilling no doubt but they'd be one of paintings yeah that's that's a such such a white umbrella that covers uh, mm -hmm. a huge variety of styles approaches uh, i don't know structures anything uh, so mm. uh, yeah it, it's really hard to define but then uh, there are some uh, some limitations of sorts uh, when you apply for designer book binders competition and uh, uh, mm -hmm. I guess not all of the bindings uh, would come not all of the design bindings would comply with this, uh, these limitations so what yeah. was it it has to be leather sorry 
it has to be leather right it still has to be leather absolutely has to no like no no no, no, no. paper <laughs> I, I, I don't know i mean i think i don't I, I, I have no objections to a design binding being made from paper. I, I don't. I, I personally, I don't think it has to be made from leather. I don't. Although all my design bindings are made from leather. <laughs> I, 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 um, but you know, I certainly wouldn't. Uh, I certainly wouldn't discount a, a paper or even a cloth binding. I mean, if you you know, it's it's. For me, I think there should be a, a design binding today. There should be some kind of artistic and expression from the binder as part of the of the process. I think that's you know that's where it becomes a sort of more unique and interesting thing. Uh, this is why I think that design uh, uh, book binding starts during the Art Nouveau period, especially mm. Mm. Jugend, right. Jugend, Jugend still in Austria, yes, because yes. that's where artists started learning book binding craft and expressing yep. themselves yep. through their work. Yeah, yeah, well, well, yeah, it's a good. Yes, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can see where you're coming from there. Yeah, uh, it, it's. It's it's an interesting <laughs> thing to uh, talk about, um, and, and to be honest, I've never I've never really self sort of analysed it that much. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I suppose you could be looking. I mean, would you would you say that the Great Omar was was a design binding? I'd say so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But then it sort of fits it fits within the tradition of, of the years when it was produced. So uh, mm. well, it it was definitely unique. But but uh, but you you can definitely see it from from where it comes. So uh, yeah, and and then there are artist books as well, which often yes. are also unique, and that's yes. that's a step into a bit different direction. So yeah. are artist books design bindings when they become design bindings? Where is this border? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's obviously a big crossover there. You know, there's there's, there's, there's no boundary between the two. I think that they both sort of merge into each other. Yeah, and I think that's as it should be. Very often, these terms don't, to me, they don't serve a great purpose. You know, uh, to, to me, design uh, book binding uh, uh, has two layers of snobbery. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it has to be. Uh, complicated in terms of craft mm -hmm. and it have to, and it has to have some artistic components so yeah. it's not artists books because th those are not good enough yeah <laughs> but, but <laughs> it be no they, they, they could be but, but you some you somehow hear the, uh, the those levels when people talk about what is and what isn't designer book mm -hmm. uh, you know i have to say it's not something that that that, that but you know, I'm particularly exercised about it. It's, uh, you know, I, I certainly I, I'm quite sort of comfortable in the type of work that I do is being described as design book binding. But you know, I think, that, that, you know, I don't, I can't think of a better term for it. But I don't think it's a very good descriptive term for it. Really, I think there's, there's, there's a bit more to it than that. You know, they often say that musical genres are marketing terms. Mm. Is design a book binding a marketing term? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's certainly the best description we have at the moment. And, and you know, I, 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 think, I, I think we all know what we, what we can expect uh, from work that is described as a de design binding. I forgot to ask, where are you territorially? You are not in one of the big cities uh, from. Well, no, I'm in a, a, a small town called Evan, which is uh, down in the Ayrshire coast. It's it's near Glasgow. It's about twenty miles from Glasgow, half an hour on the train. Uh, are you by the sea? <laughs> yes. Oh, then. Beautiful <laughs> It's beautiful here. It's uh, it's nice to see, and there's mountains in the background. That inspire you too. I mean, do you do you use, do you use like your uh, your uh, your own surroundings uh, in uh, in in your in your designs? Like, do you use those mountains, those colors, that sea? Yeah. I, I I think I do. 
but not consciously. I think it's a, 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 a subliminal level. Uh, you know, I, I think any artist would readily admit to having those influences. I mean, if, if, if you're, you're steeped in the, the colours and the, the weather, that, you know, the dramatic weather even that we get here, I mean, I think some of that does come through in my binding work. You know, if you think of the way these lines that are, that are used, you know, I think, I think living in a place like this does influence, influence me that way. And uh, interesting, Irvin itself is quite an interesting place here because it's got some really interesting links uh, to writers. And one of the things that, that I was astonished to discover uh, a few years ago is that Edgar Allan Poe lived in Irvine. He came here as a child and was actually educated here. So Edgar Allan Poe probably pulled up in a boat just outside there in the harbour side. <laughs> you know, in, the, in the early 1800s, which is, which is quite a thought. Um, and Robert Burns, of course, you know, the poet Robert, Robert Burns was from this part of Scotland. And he lived in Irvine for, uh, for, for a few years. And, he, he, you know, he, so he worked, wrote, lived here. Um, and I don't know if you've ever heard of the illustrator Agnes Miller Parker. She was a, a woodcut illustrator. Mm -hmm. She illustrated a lot of these H.E. Bates books. I don't know if you'll be aware of those, but she's, she, was a, she was born here in Irvine as well. I think it's quite interesting when when these uh, when you start to sort of dig into local. Oh, I, I've seen I've seen her work on the antiques roadshow. Uh, oh. Those uh, those curvy animals, uh, uh, yeah, foxes and hares. And... Yes, that that's that sounds. I mean, they're beautiful, beautifully meticulous, meticulously engraved woodcuts. I mean, they're, they're gorgeous things. Um, her work is is, is astonishing, really. Um, and there, there was also a, a poet called Montgomery who lived just down the road here as well. So for some reason, there's, there's a kind of concentration of literary interest uh, in, in this area. Uh, I, I've been to Glasgow a couple of years ago, but oh, uh, right. we didn't go uh, uh, to, to the south of Glasgow after we, we, we visited the city. We went north, so right. <laughs> I, I didn't have a chance to, to go anywhere near Irvine, but uh, probably next time. Uh, <laughs> well, well the, yeah, the next time you're here, definitely drop in. Yeah, okay. It'd be, be good, to, good to meet you. Yeah, thank you. Thank so you. where are, where are, where are both of you based? At, uh, I'm in Moscow, Russia. Moscow, right, yeah. right. Yeah, and I'm I'm currently in, in Versailles, in France. Uh, oh, great! Gosh, right. Well, that's yeah. not so far away. <laughs> yeah, that's not. We, we, we lived in, in the Netherlands uh, for for several years, and uh, well, that's that's from where we went to to Scotland. Uh, right. Uh, but uh, we, ne we never know because it's my wife's work uh, that uh, moves us around. Uh, ah, okay. And, okay. Uh, we can we, we can end up in in uh, in the UK or we can move back to the Netherlands or to some right. other country in in a couple of right. years. So we'll see how it goes. They they have office near London in Slough, so okay. not 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 the most fascinating <laughs> place in no. the UK. No, slow the sigh, slow the sigh. I don't know. Well, well, they're, they're, and I know what one I would think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. We'll, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But at least if, if, if we move to the UK, it will be easier to, to go around because there are, there are quite a lot of uh, uh, bookish uh, things happening in the United Kingdom and uh, Yes. We definitely, we definitely would like to return to Scotland because it's such a beautiful country, and uh, yeah, we just loved our our uh, stay there. Mm. Uh, I have to say, I think what you're doing here with your channel is is really good. Um, I, I had a, a, a when when I get the, the the rare occasion to actually switch off and just you know 
catch up on things. Uh, I, I've been tuning into some of your podcasts and, and videos, and it's, they're, they're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. It, it, it's actually been a privilege. I mean, to, uh, talking to uh, to you and all uh, all the people we, uh, we talked to, it broadened my horizons immensely. Mm. Everyone we talked to had their own story, their own background, their own yeah. process, uh, their own inspirations. Mm. Hardly anyone we talked to started out as a bookbinder. I mean, that's the, the, that, that's that's another thing that uh, all, all those backgrounds and influences uh, they uh, show in the work. It, it will be, uh, next time it will be in, uh, really interesting to, uh, to listen to your, uh, to your story. We I don't think we had sculptors before. Sorry? I don't have, we had sculptors before. You, uh, you said you, yes. you started as a sculptor. Yeah, yeah. And I and I wouldn't have guessed because your uh, your work is very graphical. I'd say mm. it's very much about the line, not about the shape. So, yes. but oddly enough, I think the the training I had as a sculptor has helped me as a bookbinder because books are three dimensional. They're not two dimensional. They're, they're three dimensional objects. So I certainly know with when I'm working in, on, on a design, I don't design on a flat surface. I'll always do most of the sort of fine detailing of the work on the book, and I'm turning the book because I'm deciding where the next tooling is going to go. So I'm looking at it in that way. You know, the thing has to work in that three-dimensional way. I often see in other binders' works where they kind of there's a tendency to fall into a trap where they, they turn the binding into three elements. It's the two boards and the spine. So it's, it then becomes three flat elements. And I think that's, that's, a, that's, that's probably not the way it should be done. You know, I think you should be looking at the book as a fully three-dimensional object and one element of the design should flow and quite naturally into the other. Uh, another thing you'll notice about my bindings is that I hardly ever title them. Oh yeah, okay. They're hard, hardly. I have titled. I think I've titled maybe two books, well three. Uh, two, two of those were titled on, on the front board, and the third one was I, I actually titled a book on the four edge ones. <laughs> So I printed, printed the title on the forage, uh, and, and 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 I don't deliberately don't tend not to, to title uh, my bindings for, for the same reason, uh, and the, it, it interrupts the flow of the design unless you really carefully integrate the titling into the design, then it can be a you know, the number of bindings I've seen that have been nice, well-worked designs, and they're just ruined by putting a title on the spine. But should it be obvious which way is up, which way is down, which yeah. way, uh, which, which side is the forward, which side is the back? I'm not sure it should be. I mean, I can open a book and tell. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, there are... There are things you can do to, you know, to visually establish what way up the book should be. And the obvious, the obvious way to do that without a title is to use an image of some sort. You know, if you put a face or something like that, and then you'll know that, it's the, that it should be orientated that way. But often what I do is I try and put some visual weight at the foot of the book. Mm -hmm. so maybe a heavier tone of the colour. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps to, you know, establish a, 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 a particular orientation. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that if you don't, if it's a purely abstract design that someone's working on and there's no title on it, then, it, you know, how do you know what we have to goes until you open up? 
Well, sometimes even with some uh, uh, visual elements that should help you to, to position the book, uh, sometimes uh, mistakes can happen, as, as we saw uh, uh, during our uh, live stream uh, several weeks ago when we discussed uh, uh, the exhibition at, at Max Brothers. <laughs> oh, right. uh, one, of, one of the books was placed upside down. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. and, and I was like, I was looking at the photo and I was like, it was okay. There is there is Eiffel Tower on the cover, and it's it's upside down. Should it be this way? <laughs> and we checked the the insides of the book, and then we saw that well, yeah, it was placed uh, uh, wrongly. <laughs> well, this mm. happens. <laughs> oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it'll happen from time to time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess we we won't uh, uh, keep you any, any any longer. As usual, I'd like to say thanks to uh, to the patrons of I Book Binding on on, on Patreon uh, because with their money we can cover editing of our podcast, and uh, obviously that's that's very important to us. So if if uh, one of one of our current viewers is ready to uh, share some of that, their money with us. Uh, pledges start with only one dollar uh, per month, uh, so I hope it's not uh, not too much. Uh, uh, thank you to all of our viewers and members of our community. You can find all the useful links uh, down below uh, the video. We'll post some links to uh, Tom's uh, Instagram and uh, website uh, so that you can uh, find out more and more of his work. And uh, join us next time. Thanks. Thanks a lot. See you. Bye. Bye. See you later. See you later. <laughs>